This morning is taken from the first letter of John, which unlike Paul's letters, which were addressed usually to a particular city or the people of a city or some particular situation, appears to be just in general and possibly directed to all Christians. We'll read chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. There is no fear in love, but for perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. But whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of God for the people of God. Clyde, I haven't seen you since you got back from Africa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have to say thank you to uh, Clyde for taking such good care, I guess, of my son since he, since I was without him and I was, <laughs> he did fine without me, I know, but <laughs> well, we do welcome our Africa group back. They've been back now for over a week. Has it been a week and a half? And we're just glad you had a wonderful trip. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it in the months to come. Join me in prayer. God, as we share in this message this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our spirits, that you would speak to us anew. You would renew us, inspire us, transform us, and send us back into the world, new people full of your grace and your love. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. Well, if you heard Paul speak of Toy Story, that this will round up. It'll finish my sermon series. We've looked at movies over the last several weeks and what they teach us about ourselves, our own life experience. And in a sense, art, literature, movies, whatever it may be, it, it's not so much about the movie, but it's about holding a mirror up and looking into our own souls. That's where we find ourselves caught and captivated by the different stories that we've heard over the last several weeks. First of all, who has at least seen one of the four to to toy stories? Blech, that's a mouthful, toy stories. Anyone seen the new one? I have not seen the new one, the fourth one. Um, yeah, I was thinking the first one came out in 1995, and when my boys were little, they loved toy stories. So we saw them over and over and over again. They loved the fighting scenes, you know, and we had Buzz Lightyears all over the place. So this is one of the movies that I love. And one of the things that they've talked about in, in recent years with Toy Story is, yes, children love it, but adults love it just as much, right? There's so much in these particular movies. Toy Story begins, the first uh, Toy Story 1 begins on Andy's birthday and Andy owns all these toys and what's interesting about the all of the the movies is Andy the humans are really not the stars of the show in fact you don't even often see the faces of the children you see them from waist down but the toys become the stars they're alive and suddenly you see these toys and you see these interactions that are happening and these relationships and the struggles and the conflict and the resolution that happens throughout these movies. And, and so when you see the toys, you actually, you sort of see yourself. <laughs> these toys, this movie reminds us of who we are as human beings. It, it, it unveils for us something about the human condition. We are seeing something that connects with our souls, if you will. And, and when I watch these, I'm drawn in to the story because I say to myself, this is my story. This is my life experience. 
well, there's always a conflict in the story, and it's always working toward a resolution. And in the movie today, uh, in Toy Story 1, we're going to see a conflict that I believe we all can identify with. And it begins on Andy's birthday, and, and, and it begins with the anxiety that it produces for the toys that a new toy might just show up and replace them. Take a look. Can you see what it? What the heck is up there? Woody, who's up there with you? <coughs> uh, Woody, what are you doing under the bed? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing. I'm sure Andy was just a little excited, that's all. Too much cake and ice cream, I suppose. It's just a mistake. Well, that mistake is sitting in your spot, Woody. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been replaced? Hey, what did I tell you earlier? No one is getting replaced. Now let's all be polite and give whatever it is up there a nice, big Andy's room welcome. replaced <laughs> what do you think Woody is feeling right now today's story speaks to this idea of insecurity of a sense oh someone's cell phone went off <laughs> of this sense of really down at the heart of who he is, this wrestling with, do I matter? Am I loved? And, and, and I believe that this points to a fundamental conflict in our own hearts throughout our life. I mean, we have periods where it comes and goes, but, but are we being replaced? Do we matter? Are we being rejected? Underneath it all is the question, are we loved? Can you think of a time in your life where you can identify with this particular human experience, this human condition? And if we think about it, this story is our story. The toys are holding up this mirror and helping us understand ourselves just a little bit better. And, and the reality is you don't get through life without having some experiences of inadequacy, a feeling less than and questioning your own worth. Maybe it's a feel, fear of failure. Maybe it's a fear of, of growing older and, and you're not able to do what it is you were once able to do. Maybe it's a fear of rejection, whatever it may be. Underneath it all is this fundamental fear and this insecurity, if you will, of being loved. In the end, the question we want and what we long for, I believe what I long for and what you long for in your life is to have purpose and to feel loved. Well, I was thinking in my my own family life when I had three children, uh, each child that came along. Of course, they talk a lot about siblings and bringing a new child in. And I specifically remember my third son when he, when I was pregnant with Wynn, uh, Ethan and Will were still little, but they obviously knew another uh, human was going to come into their space and take up their space. And I remember sitting with them one day and saying, come on over, you know, come talk to your baby, the new baby that's going to be in, in the family. And Ethan came and said hi, you know, and ran off. And, and Will came over. He was about uh, two and a half. And um, he patted the baby with the sweetest little voice. And he said, oh, hi, little baby. I can't wait till you come into this world because I'm going to kick you and beat you. And I was like, oh, my Lord. He's an evil human right here. <laughs> And I don't want you to be born. You know, in all this, like, sweet voice, I was like, oh, it's like a devil child. <laughs> He's much better now, isn't he, Clyde? Where are you? <laughs> He's much better. He, he outgrew that. <laughs> but, 
but that's the thing, and, and we, we are constantly wrestling in life with, are we, do we have value? Do we matter? I was happening to, don't ask me why, I happen to have football on. I almost never do, but there was a game, I think it was Thursday, and, and I was just fascinated listening as the commentators pit the old guys with the new, and you know, I wonder if they'll be able to keep up with the new this and new that, and there was just constant wrestling, even in that particular uh, situation. So, so this is something that happens in every part of life. And the question for us this morning, for us to spend some time reflecting on in a deeper level, is what insecurities do you wrestle with? I had to ask myself that quite a bit as I prepared for this particular message, and, and we all wrestle with insecurities. I, I'll, I'll share with you one. It's not deeply personal, but it's something that I struggle with um, in terms of inadequacy that I can't seem to get over. But how many of you people are golfers? I am telling you, how, Cindy, how are you a golfer? It is the hardest sport. I have this every time I, I, st- I am invited to golf. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I feel like I should do this. And I have this vision of me getting up every time, swinging that golf club and missing the ball. I, and I do it every once in a while. It's horrible. But that's one of my um, insecurities. Please don't invite me to go play golf with you. <laughs> I, you don't want me. I'm terrible. But, but you know, here's the thing. That's a light, fun insecurity, but we wrestle deep with these insecurities, and they lead, as you think of them in a deeper and deeper way, they lead to some pretty dark things. If you'll just, uh, if you'll let me spend a little bit of time with my first love, psychology. My mom happens to be a psychologist, so I'm always trying to incorporate psychology into faith. And psychologists talk a lot about this, this intense need to feel secure. And, And they talk about it in different ways and the way it plays itself out. One is being a people pleaser. I'm a re- certainly a, a working on being a recovering people pleaser. You want to kill yourself to please people. That's part of what we have to work with. And psychology would say that at the bottom, at the root of a lot of the underlying feelings of that is the fear of rejection or the fear, this fear of not feeling loved. Another thing that psychologists talk a lot about is uh, an individual who might be a bragger. Do you know someone who's a bragger who does a lot of boasting maybe about their home, their salary, the way they play a sport, whatever it may be? And, and, and the reality is that the, if we can stop and step out and step back and have some compassion, we see that this is really about this deep insecurity that a person has to be convinced that they're worthy, that they have value. A third way of dealing with insecurity is that we try to hurt other people. You know when you try to knock other people down so you can feel better about yourself. Maybe it's talking about another person behind their back. You know, it just makes me feel a little bit better about myself if I knock that person down a couple notches. You know, constantly criticizing another person. I can't help but think as school begins here in the state, actually this week, believe it or not, I can't help but think of cyberbullying and how bad it's gotten in the high schools. And my prayer is that those who feel the need to hurt other people somehow can have people come around them and love them and offer places of compassion because it moves from that to worse where we begin to celebrate the downfall of others. When it turns to bitterness and resentment, I would even argue that it turns to deep hate. I feel like I can't go without speaking of the unspeakable tragedy that happened yesterday in El Paso and and why I do not ever claim to have answers, especially to big issues, complex issues. I do wonder as I was listening to the story unfold about the manifesto of hate that was shared. And I just, I have to wonder, (laughs) these deep insecurities, these deep-rooted insecurities that we have, when they go unchecked, it's hate. 
I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus was crucified because of the insecurity that was surrounding him. And if you go back to the biblical story, this is our story. It is throughout all of the scripture. If you go back to Genesis, you know the story of Cain and Abel. It's a farmer. It's an archetypal story. It's a, uh, one was a farmer and one was a shepherd. And, and the farmer, Cain, God was showing a more favor to the shepherd. And, and Cain didn't like that. And he grew more and more bitter to the point where he took his little brother out in the fields and he killed him. That's exa one example of many when we see these insecurities, the fear that turns into hate. Well, in the movie, the Toy Story, Woody is not near that bad. He's a pretty good guy, but he does wrestle with these insecurities. Is he loved? Does he matter? Is he needed anymore in Andy's life? And he gets really tired of Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> and so he devises a plan to get rid of him. Take a look. Pizza Planet? Oh, cool. Go wash your hands. One toy? Will Andy pick me? Don't count on it! Oh! Trouble. Trouble? Where? Down there. Just down there. A helpless toy. It's, it's, he's trapped, Buzz. Then we've no time to lose. I don't see anything. Uh, he's there. Just, just keep <laughs> looking. <laughs> chapter the 30 verse a heart at peace gives life to the body but envy rots the bones what is rotting away our insides how do we find that peaceful mind that the writer of Proverbs refers to? Well, there are two answers. There are many answers, but there are two answers that jumped out at me as I was preparing for this from the Bible that are pretty clear if you think about them. One is something that Jesus says about your enemy. Now, Buzz Lightyear isn't really his enemy. He's more of his nemesis. But what does Jesus say to do to your enemy? Love them. Pray for them. See, love isn't a feeling. It's not that mushy, smushy feeling that I'm referring to in this particular part of the Greek. Love is an action. It's something that happens and something that we choose to do. And see, when we choose to love as a discipline, as a spiritual discipline, and something happens to our hearts. John Wesley said he had the warming, strangely, strangely his heart was warmed. I always think of the Grinch, remember in the Grinch, the movie his heart grew several sizes. Something happens to us when we live this biblical principle out. When we practice love, we have a hard time feeling resentful and bitter. 
It becomes an antidote, if you will, to our own insecurities. When we practice love, we become the very thing that we are doing, I would argue. When we practice love, even though we don't feel like it, that's what agape, love, really is, we are changed. And see, the scripture this morning that you heard Clyde read, it says there is no fear in love. I would say I would replace fear for insecurity. There is no insecurity in love. But perfect love casts out all insecurities. When we practice love toward each other, we are changed. And see, this is what we see in Toy Story. We see that Woody and Buzz have this particular scene where they continue to have this conflict, but finally they've been, uh, they've been kidnapped from Sid, the mean next-door neighbor to Andy. He's this mean bully, and he is very mean to his toys. He, he actually um, has, he devises this plan. Sid decides he's going to destroy both Woody and Buzz. He's going to take Woody apart, and he's going to shoot a rocket, and Buzz is going to explode in the air. And they find themselves in this particular scene and, and where Buzz Lightyear realizes he's really not that special. He's just a toy like any other toy, and he's ready to give up. And so in that particular moment, you see Woody, you see him realize that Buzz is not much different than him, that he has feelings, he has inadequacies too. And suddenly, Woody overcomes his own insecurities to try to bless and encourage him. Take a look. Hey, Buzz! Get over here and see if you can get this toolbox off me. Oh, come on, Buzz. I... Buzz, I can't do this without you. I need your help. I can't help. I can't help anyone. Why, sure you can, Buzz. You can get me out of here, and then I'll get that rocket off you, and we'll make a break for Andy's house. Andy's house? Sid's house? What's the difference? Oh, Buzz... You've had a big fall. You must not be thinking clearly. No, Woody. For the first time, I am thinking clearly. You were right all along. I'm not a space ranger. I'm just a toy, a stupid, little, insignificant toy. Whoa, hey, wait a minute. Being a toy is a lot better than being a a space ranger. Yeah, right. No, it is. Look, over in that house is a kid who thinks you are the greatest, and it's not because you're a space ranger, pal. It's because you're a toy. You are his toy. But why would Andy want me? Why would Andy want you? Look at you! You're a Buzz Lightyear! Any other toy would give up his moving parts just to be you. You've got wings! You glow in the dark! You talk! Your helmet does that, that, that whoosh thing! You are a cool toy! (laughs) Paul tells us what love does and doesn't look like. Paul says, love isn't jealous, it doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant, it isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage, it isn't irritable, it doesn't keep a record of complaints, it isn't happy with injustice. And then Paul tells us what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all kinds of things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So how do we deal with our insecurities? The first thing is we love. We do the right thing even when we don't feel like it. That's what mercy is. That's what we're given in God's grace. And secondly, I believe as people of faith that we find our security in God. The overarching theme of the gospel is that God is love. 
that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. That God knows your name, God knows your story, God knows everything about you and still loves you. All the inadequacies and failures that you and that I have had in this life, we are still loved. When you look at Jesus' short ministry of three years and his, his life, his ministry, his death, and then his resurrection, he is always pointing, and the stories are all pointing us to this one particular thing, and is that you are deeply loved by God. And here's the thing. I believe if you and if I can internalize that down to the core of who we are and trust it, then it has the power to change not only your life, but the world. The world needs our love. One of the things that I love about communion each month as we celebrate the holy table and the gathering of Jesus and his disciples is it was in a time in Jesus' life where he was nearing the end. He had all those around him who wanted him to die, who were calling crucify him, yet he still loved. And so to show that, he gathered his disciples one last time. And he taught them. He taught them through the washing of the feet by showing them what a servant really is like. He taught them by saying, I'll be gone, but they'll know about me because of you and your love that you show the world. And then he took, in the midst of that Seder meal, he took bread And he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is a reminder that my body will be broken for you. But he said, take and eat, because I want you to remember the love I've given you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then at the end of the Seder meal, and Seder meals have lots of cups, he took the last cup and he paused with his beloved disciples, as he says to us today. And he said, this is a reminder that my blood will be shed for you because of the sacrificial love I have for you. But he said, drink of this cup often. It is a cup reminding you that you are forgiven. That in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your pain, I will make you whole. Drink of it often in remembrance of me. We ask, O God, that you would pour upon these gifts of bread and of grape your Holy Spirit. That you would make us one with you, one with each other, and one with all of the world until you come again. Amen. And the United Methodist tradition, at at this time I would invite those who are serving communion forward, those who are stewards this morning. And in the United Methodist tradition, we serve through intinction, where you take a piece of the bread and you dip it into the grape juice. If you are gluten-free, we do have gluten-free bread, and then we have a little juice cup. So just let your... um, let your steward know and they will certainly happily share with you gluten-free. You're also invited to stay and pray at the altar for as long as you'd like. Take some time to just linger and be in prayer in this time. The table is set and all are welcome.